Hello, welcome to this very special edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at the famous Blue Note Jazz Club here in New York City. Blessing the band stage all week and celebrating his 70th birthday is legendary seven-time Grammy Award winning vibraphonist and composer Gary Burton. Gary has a lot to celebrate and one, he's just released his autobiography, Learning to Listen, The Jazz Journey of Gary Burton on Berkeley Press, as well as his brand new quartet album on the Mac Avenue's record imprint entitled The Guided Tour. We sat down earlier and we talked about why it took so long to put this book together. Also, we reflect on bits and pieces of his career, and we also reflect on some of the special guests who took part of this week's 70th birthday celebration. And I'm talking about performances with the legendary Arturo Sandoval, as well as Terrence Blanchard, as well as guitarist Larry Coriel. If you might recall, Larry Coriel was one of the first guitarists that played in Gary's quartet in the mid to late 1960s. And this is the very first time that these guys have played together in almost 40 years. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the sounds of Mr. Gary Burton in his 70th birthday celebration live here at the Blue Note here in New York City. Every time we sit down, you know, you have something very important in your life that just keeps evolving musically and also personally. And you have two. You turned 70 
you have a brand new autobiography. I mean, three, and you have a new CD. You've been pretty busy. It's, it's been a busy year, I have to say. And everything, I didn't realize everything with, with the record and the book were going to come together at the same time. I, you know, that wasn't originally part of the plan, but as circumstances, you know, played out, we discovered that the release of the both the book and the CD were going to be at about the same month, so we c tried to combine them for maximum impact. You know, reading a lot of autobiographies, I'm a big history buff, and reading this, you know, you were very, very professional about the highs and the lows of your career. You were very candid about, you know, coming out. And the thing that I really admire about this book is that you gave the readers a very, very in-depth encounter of how you evolved musically. Well, I wanted my story to be uh, honest and complete. And a lot of the jazz biographies that I was have been reading to get ideas, you know, for my own, uh, were a lot about, uh, well, everybody played great, and this went well, and we had a good time, and, and it, you know, uh, didn't, there's a lot of kind of avoiding getting into the more deeply personal aspects of uh, the, the musicians' lives. And uh, I wanted to uh, see if I could paint portraits of important musicians that I knew and know uh, that were uh, not just all how wonderful they are, but also their frailties and their ups and downs, and the same with my, my own career. Uh, I wanted it to come across uh, more complete and more honestly. You know, Gary, the, the thing about you as a musician, and you keep evolving, everyone keeps evolving, one thing that I've noticed about you with your different ensembles that you play with, you really enjoy bringing out young and fresh talent. That's been something that's been high on Gary's... Yeah. <laughs> From the beginning, uh, I've been drawn to younger players. There's, uh, there's a quality of energy and excitement that comes uh, that you get from younger players uh, they challenge you more they're willing to take more risks and try things and there's this what I call the unpredictability of youth you know there's lots of surprises when you're playing with somebody who's still new at it and I still remember what it felt like to look forward to every night on the gig couldn't couldn't wait to get back to the club to play you don't feel that way quite so much after you've done it for 50 years. And uh, so I like to have some young players around uh, to keep me fired up, keep me challenged and, and interested. So uh, it's worked well for me over the years.
part of the 70th birthday celebration for Gary Burton. Yeah. What does he mean to jazz music? Gary Burton is, I mean, he's, he's one of our, what's the word, jazz royalty, <laughs> you know. He's one of the guys who's been a pioneer on that instrument, not only on the instrument, but in music in general. A lot of the great things that he's done throughout his career has inspired a lot of people, including myself. Um, so I was, I was really honored, you know, when I got the call to come and do this because uh, I've been a big fan of his for a number of years and it's a pleasure playing with him. Tonight you guys collaborated on some of your material and his and mm -hmm. Ellington. What is it like playing on the bandstand with him? It's, it's truly interesting because, you know, <laughs> I was always on the other side of the bandstand listening to him for so many years. To stand right next to him now, it's a, it's a, it's a wild experience, you know, because um, I'm getting a chance to see him do his thing. I mean, standing there next to Car Scott Carley, you know, with uh, Julian on a uh, guitar. It's amazing. It's, it's been so much fun so far. And don't forget my man, uh, Sanchez. Yeah. What does he bring to the vibes? He brought a different vernacular to the music as well as the uh, the vibraphone. Well, the first thing that when you talk about Gary and the vibraphone, the first thing I think about is that he brought a certain type of proficiency to the instrument with a clarity that uh, Art Blakey always used to talk about getting past the floodlights, getting your, your statement out there. And Gary had a unique talent for, me, for being able to uh, make strong, powerful musical statements, you know, on the instrument, which changed our view of the instrument and its role in jazz, which, is, which has been amazing. You know, this week we um, have some old friends and we have some new friends. You uh, collaborated this week with the legendary Arturo Sandoval. Tonight is Terrence Blanchard, and this weekend you're going back to really the beginning, Larry Coriel. This is the first time you guys played in almost 40 years. Yep, 45 years, actually. Uh, we uh, played together first in my first band as a leader. That was 1967, 68. Larry was the guitarist in the band. And uh, then we went our separate ways after that. Larry, of course, has had his own career with own bands and collaborations and me with mine. And uh, I was never much for <clears throat> reunions, for going back and recreating the old group and putting the old band together again, that sort of thing. That didn't start sounding interesting to me until recently, until I got older. When I was younger, certainly, all I was doing was looking forward and say, so what, you know, where to go next that I haven't been yet. And uh, so this engagement came up and we were talking about having guest musicians come in and my original concept frankly was to have three guitar players since I've had a lot of guitar players over the years I first thought well maybe I can find three of my former guitar players who would be available and started calling around Larry was available which was great but everyone else I called was working in Europe or touring somewhere else or whatever. So I gave up on the guitar idea after a while and just asked myself, well, who do I know? Who are friends of mine for years that I would like to play with and uh, uh, for a couple of nights here at the club and ended up, oddly enough, settling on two trumpet players, Arturo and Terrence. But Larry was part of the original game plan to uh, bring back some of the guitar players I worked with. So it will be uh, kind of a historic uh, you know, reunion as, as things go. Uh, we haven't played in all those years. You did a reunion with Pat Metheny back in 92, and that was a huge right. success. Uh, we did. Um, again, he was in my band for four years and then went on to become very well established on his own. And we had talked about eventually, you know, doing something together again. And finally, we got around to it. And since then, we we do get together and do a new project uh, every few years. It's not every year. Uh, every three to five years, we do another little tour or a new record project or something. In fact, our current plan is to reunite again uh, in 2015. We've put it on the calendar. That's, that's how we start one of these things is we have to put the time aside first and then ultimately as it gets closer we decide what the music would be when we get get there 
Because I remember the last time we broke bread, you said that when you and Chick Career record, you guys do it after you do the tour. Right. Well, Chick and I have a different rhythm in a way. We play every year. We've 41 years. We've never skipped a year. We do at least one tour. Uh, every year and every five years or so we make another record and then we tour more if we have a new record coming out we'll devote most of a year to it but um, but even in off years we we always put aside a month somewhere to uh, to take our duets on the road and we did discover that we like to try the music out in front of audiences before we record so we'll typically do uh, 15 concerts or something like that um, with the new music, trying it out, rehearsing during the daytime, adding new tunes as we go through the, the tour till we feel we've uh, you know gotten prepared. And then we record, and then six months later the record comes out, and then we tour again with the, you know, along to support the record.
Larry, tell me the very first time you met Gary Burton. Oh my goodness. I was in a band, kind of a folk rock band, avant-garde, thrown in. Band in New York in 1966 or seven. And Gary came down to hear us for some reason because he was looking for a guitar player to become a member of the quartet that he was about to form. And that's that's how we that was the motive for meeting. How did he approach you, or how did the the like spirits get together? Well, he, he introduced himself, and he said, and he said exactly that he was thinking about putting together a quartet and uh, of his you know becoming a leader. And uh, I had seen him; I was very aware of his recordings and his live uh, playing. I'd heard his records, and I'd seen him play, and uh, I was naturally interested. Reflecting back over forty years now. Did you guys ever think now that you guys would be the icons that you have become to jazz music around the world now? Uh, no. No. What we, what we were trying to do was try to put a, another spin on the jazz experience that would be, that would still show respect for the for the forerunners of the music, but still have some relevance to the generation in which we were living. What does Gary Burton mean to jazz music, as well as the vibes? Well, he's a he's a great. I mean, the vibes are basically a jazz instrument to me, and uh, you know, he's coming out of Lionel Hampton, Bobby Hutchison. Uh, Red Norvo, he was a lot of Red Norvo in there, but he was also an innovator with the four mallet technique, and he has a very beautiful lyrical way of playing. And he, he means to, to jazz is just more than than a than a player because he's also been a lifetime, lifelong educator. You know, he was very, very. Um, Prominent at the Berkeley School of Music, helped to make that institution the great institution that it is now. And he's he's a natural educator. He he likes to listen. He likes to help. Like last night, he let his guitar player play like nearly 20 minutes by himself. Pretty cool. You know, he never tries to hog the spotlight. He's just. Uh, He's a great musician, a good human being, and uh, a great, he's a great educator. So I think he'll be remembered for being a great player and a great educator. Gary, one of the things that you just touched upon about the book is that you, you, you candidly talk about you know, you coming out. And one of the things I wanted to ask you, um, a person watching this and a person reading this book, maybe who's 19 or maybe who's 99, how do, what advice do you give a person who's struggling to come to terms with that? Well, I had hoped back, this was now back in the late 80s and early 90s when I uh, changed my identity uh, publicly and declared that I was a gay man and changed my life, reorganized my life completely and now I'm married to my longtime partner and so on. Um, I had hoped it would uh, serve as something reassuring to uh, any young players who uh, were wrestling with this topic themselves, and maybe it has been helpful. I, I hope so. Uh, it was a lot different when I was growing up. I mean, I came of age in the 1950s, living in you know small town Indiana. Uh, there was no opportunity to be gay or to have a, any kind of a life. And there was no one to talk to about it. There was no information available. Uh, you were on your own, so to speak. So that has changed a lot. Nowadays, uh, there's lots of resources available to people who are wrestling with their sexuality and trying to figure these things out. They can get information. They can get help. They can get advice. They families are more supportive, friends are more supportive. It's becoming uh, almost a non-issue in the music business, to be honest. And uh, if I've been a, even a small part of that, me along with 
other you know musicians both in in jazz and in pop music and 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 so on uh, if, if we've helped uh, open those doors more then uh, I'm glad you know that that's been the case I, I love the the degree of acceptance that's uh, normal now and it'll it'll continue to get better uh, it still has a way to go but uh, we've made tremendous progress as a society in in the last 20 years Gary we've got to talk about the guided tour your okay. second record from on Mac Avenue Records and this you got the, the the usual suspects uh you got julian you've got scott you got antonio what is it about this second record on mac avenue records that you were doing musically well the first record uh was kind of a surprise to us when i formed the band the original plan was to do one month-long tour of europe i had just finished a long stretch of a, a two years of touring with chick Corea to celebrate our 35 years of playing together and and so on and we did a kind of a world tour and I got back home took a break for a while and my manager said well what do you want to do next and I wasn't sure and he said why don't you put a band together we'll you know set up a European tour for you who would you like to play with and I thought first of Julian because he and I had had been playing quite a bit together uh, earlier in the decade but he'd gone off to college and I'd gone off to tour with Chick and so on so he was finishing college now and was available so I thought well I'd like to reconnect with Julian and uh, I had worked a fair amount with Antonio starting in about 2005 because of projects with Pat Metheny and I knew Scott we had played together just one time some years ago but I knew he worked a lot with Antonio so I figured he would be a good choice what I didn't know when I assembled this group and started the tour was how compatible we were going to be. Uh, it's, this turned out to be one of the best combinations of musicians. The chemistry between the players, our personalities, our musical styles, our vision of the songs and so on is just so balanced and so in tune that uh, when I got back from that tour, I immediately booked the studio for us to make our first record, Common Ground. And of course we then started touring with the band after that uh, over the next year and then it soon became time to uh, follow up with another record and if anything the band has continued to evolve uh, to in a way deepen this rapport that we have. You only find this kind of great balance in a band now and then. I can probably count four times in my whole career that I've been in a band that, you know, fit together so well as this. So we're having a great time every night when we go out to play. And uh, when I hear the new record, it feels like a, just the perfect continuation of the first one, uh, which was, again, mostly music written by all of us in the band. So everybody contributes quite equally. And we did the same thing with Guided Tour. And, uh, you know, we've, we've traveled some distance as a group since that first one, you know, which was uh, we only knew each other for a, as players for a month at that time. And now it's been, you know, over a period of three years. So we're even more, you know, locked in with our playing than we, than we were at the beginning. <laughs>
George, you were very, very instrumental early on in Gary's career. What was the first time you met Gary? I met him in 1960. He came to Newport with the uh, with Chet Atkins and a lot of people from RCA Victor in Nashville. Or Memphis, I guess Nashville. And when I heard him play, I couldn't believe it with the four mallets. He was playing exactly that same way when he was uh, in 1960, 50, 53 years ago. What is that? Yeah, that's 53 years ago. And he played, he was as great then as he is now. It's, it's amazing how he could do something that no other vibe player ever could really do. They could play four mallets, but not like Gary. It was wonderful to see that group. Uh, uh, Julian Lodge and seeing Tissy. I was instrumental in Terrence's career, too. I gave Terrence and Donald their first album. It's wonderful to see them up there. And I'm still here to see them. That's the most important thing. Gary, one of the things you did in your autobiography is you broke down with a xylophone and well, the, the two different types of instruments. Mm -hmm. And you also broke down and analyze the concept of all the great xylophone players. At 70 years old, what do Red Norville and Bobby Hutchinson and Lionel Hampton, what do they mean to you right now? Well, the history of the vibraphone is um, uh, dependent on a, a small number of players because there aren't so many of us not like the piano players of which there were hundreds that you could list that made important contributions to jazz. With the vibraphone, you can sort of track the history of the instrument a few players at a time. Uh, the, er the early generation, the first players in the 1930s uh, were Lionel Hampton and Red Norvo. Uh, Lionel on vibes and Red on xylophone up until the 40s when he switched to vibes as well. But they were both the pioneering jazz mallet players. And it was certainly Hamp that put the vibraphone on the map, so to speak. It had just been invented in 1930. And during the 1930s, he's played for five years with Benny Goodman, the most popular jazz band of the day. And so a lot of people got to see what a vibraphone looks like and sounds like. So that got the instrument uh, established. And the next generation that came along was dominated by Milt Jackson of the Modern Jazz Quartet. Now we're talking the uh, later 40s and the 50s. And this was when I was going to high school in the 1950s, and Milt was, was the star player, certainly uh, in my eyes. Uh, he was the, the, had the most records out, for one thing, for me to find uh, in, out in rural Indiana. And, uh, and I just liked his style. I don't play like Milt at all, because he was a two mallet player and I play with four mallets, mm -hmm. so it sort of took me in a different direction, but I consider Milt to be, you know, perhaps the, the most important vibist in the history of the instrument, really helped define the sound of it uh, during those middle years. And there were other players too, like Terry Gibbs, for instance, uh, can think of some others, but I'll, finally, my generation. I think the two, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the two main names <coughs> uh, for my, <coughs> sorry, the two main names from my era are myself and Bobby Hutcherson. <coughs> we're about, we're about, Ayers. and Roy Ayers. There's another one, and Mike Maneri is another one. But we're all about the same age, and uh, each kind of finding our own style. Bobby was very much in the Milt Jackson style. Roy found his own style of jazz and is very big in, in the dance music and so on. And I found my style, which was, is based around my four mallet approach to the instrument, uh, more pianistic in, in approach to the instrument. Now there's a, a new generation of vibraphone players, Stefan Harris, uh, Warren Wolf, Joe Locke, all come to mind. Steve Nelson is another one that are all d doing great. And uh, I think the instrument's in good hands uh, and the future looks great. There'll be, there will be more coming up as well, that's for sure. <laughs>
Jerry, at 70 years old, are there some things that you would change or are there things that you want to do, you like to keep them the same or are there some things that you want to try out and experiment and further broaden Gary Burton's horizon? Well, there could always be a new project come along that, uh, you know, I'm not anticipating at all, but it grabs me and says, wow, let's, let's try this, let's do it. Uh, I have done pretty much all the things I set out to do in the beginning. I've made 60-some records in my career. I've played with all the players that I've greatly admired and wanted to collaborate with. So I don't feel like I've got a, a checklist of things that I've got to get to. What I do feel like when I look at the future is that I've built up a body of work and a level of integrity. And my job now as a 70-year-old band leader and vibes player is to make sure I maintain the level, the quality, and the, the inventiveness of what I'm doing for as long as I can. So that's sort of my, my idea of what I'm supposed to be responsible for from this point on. Are you happy with this generation of jazz, this, this next legacy carrying on the baton? Do you think that today's younger generation musicians are really in tune with the masters as well as the craft of playing the music? I do very much so. Uh, the, the young players of today had advantages uh, growing up that were not around in my time. Uh, these musicians have been able to play jazz from a very young age to begin with. Uh, they had teachers, they had you know, jazz band opportunities in school, they had c many colleges to choose from that have jazz programs to go to. Uh, today's young jazz musicians are far more educated and uh, highly developed than the equivalent young musicians back in the 1950s or 60s when I was starting out. Uh, I, I'm very impressed. I find more you know, prodigy-like uh, jazz players uh, coming out of the woodwork nowadays than, than I ever expected. It's, uh, I think it's a great time to be a jazz fan. That'll do it again for this very special edition of the Pace Report, reporting live here at the Blue Note here in New York City. I'd like to personally congratulate Mr. Gary Burden on 70 years of giving the world his beautiful and unique gift of music as well as the special comments from Larry Coriel, as well as Terrence Blanchard. And I also want to personally thank the staff and management here at the Blue Note always for their warm hospitality. As always, please visit my website, www.thepacereport.com, for my weekly column as well as my past segments. Until next time, remember if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Till next time, peace.